everything you want is right here We gon' give them what they came for We gon' take it up from last year Shoot them a shot, boy, I'm long range Me and the team on the same thing Stay down, never switched up Only thing changed was the game I'm in the zone now Nothing can change what we on now When I pull up, know it's going down Foot on the gas, ain't no slowing down It's college basketball's most treasured time of the year, March Madness, and we have it covered for you right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. I'm Mike Waddell, along with David Glenn, covering his 37th March Madness. And David, I tell you one thing, the the weekend in Washington, D.C. had to have been one of the most memorable of your time in covering the Atlantic Coast Conference. Yeah, Mike, it's great to be with you. And a couple of quick reminders who are for those who are relatively new to the North Carolina Sports Network. Number one, we're going to hit all five of those ACC matchups uh, in the NCAA tournament. We'll even look ahead a little bit. We will talk about Pitt and Wake, who unfortunately did not make the NCAA tournament. But in Wake's case, we'll be playing in the NIT. And then quick reminder, sprinkled in today, my good friend Mike Waddell is going to tell you all about a bacon and basketball and NCAA bracket challenge that we have here at the North Carolina Sports Network. It's our first year. Our foundational partner is the North Carolina Pork Council here in North Carolina. And my friend Mike has cooked up a fun challenge for our viewers and followers and listeners. But we're going to get to the basketball. We're going to get to hopefully that fun challenge that we hope as many of our followers, viewers, and listeners will jump in. Of course, it's free. Uh, Mike will tell you about how you can enter yourself. Just have fun with the bracket. There's no pressure. You can have bragging rights forever to beat me in my bracket. And I've been at this, as Mike said, for 37 years. But I'm glad you asked me that as a starting point, Mike, because, of course, we're going to be ACC-centric with our conversation today. And I hope folks will check out our assessment of that great State Carolina title game from D.C. I was there representing us on Press Row. Our intern, Ben McCormick, got to see his first ever ACC tournament, and he saw one of the most exciting of the 71. So great timing on that young man's part. But for those trying to understand how the bracket was formulated, I want to emphasize something that I've been trying to pound into our friends across North Carolina and beyond for more than a month now. And that is the selection committee. Those who listened to me were not surprised. Those who didn't listen to me or didn't believe me were surprised on Selection Sunday. I'll say it one more time. The selection committee does not care what your conference's record is head-to-head against another conference. They don't care what your conference's overall rating is compared to other conferences. They don't care. Those who are confused on Selection Sunday are those who insist on emphasizing the accomplishments of a given league compared to another league. I have been on more than a dozen NCAA tournament mock selection committees. I can promise you, never, not occasionally, not once in a while, never, when you're analyzing the final at-large candidates, never does it come up what their conference did. What does come up is what they did. What that team near the bubble did do or did not do. And here's the bottom line if you don't believe me. Yes, the Big 12 was considered by most the number one conference in America this year. Yes, the Big 12 got eight bids this season, in part reflecting how good they are, but mostly reflecting the eight individual resumes that got into the big dance. But underlining and emphasizing my main point, the Big East was considered deservedly one of the best leagues in America this year. You know what the Big East got? Three bids. So for those complaining that the ACC got only five bids, remember, we are living in a conspiracy theory world, 
And we are, there are just way too many Americans whose first explanation for everything is a conspiracy theory. No, it's not a conspiracy theory. They're not against the ACC. They're not against the Big East. What they did was they looked at UConn, Big East member. They had a dazzling resume. Guess what? That resume was respected with a number one seed. Then they looked at Marquette, dazzling resume. Guess what? Shaka Smart's team was rewarded with a two seed. Then they looked at Creighton, the third best team in the Big East. Guess what? No conspiracy. Creighton had a great track record. They were rewarded with a three seed. A one seed, a two seed, a three seed from the Big East. That's a great league, right? But then what happened? There was no conversation about the Big East being one of the two best leagues in America. That conversation is over. It's just for fun and talking heads during the regular season and fans as well. Nothing wrong with conference versus conference comparisons. But when you bring up conference versus conference comparisons in the Selection Sunday context, you are only confusing yourself and your friends. After those first three Big East teams all got very high seeds, they looked at St. John's resume. They looked at Seton Hall's resume. They looked at Providence's resume. And you know what they decided? Those next three teams in the Big East, the almighty Big East, weren't quite good enough when their individual resumes were evaluated. The bottom line is none of those three Big East teams, while good teams, had enough high caliber wins to get them the benefit of the doubt in the final crunch for the final at-large slots. Same thing happened to Pitt and Wake Forest in the Atlantic Coast Conference. It's not a conspiracy. If you will simply look at how many really good wins does a team have, how many losses do they have, and where did those wins take place? If you wanted to boil it down to three things, those would be the three. You will understand 99% of what happens in Selection Sunday if you will just cling to those three things and wash out of your brain, for example, the ACC's head-to-head -head record against the Big 12. It's a fun number because it reflects well on the ACC. It has absolutely, positively zero to do with the assessment of Pitt's resume or Wake Forest's resume. Virginia got in, folks, because they had three great wins at Clemson over the Florida Gators and against Texas A&M. And oh, by the way, two of those three great wins were away from John Paul Jones Arena. And you know what? Pitt didn't get in because they had only two great wins. Now, they were great at Duke, at UVA, both NCAA tournament teams, both on the road. But when you have only two great wins in mid-March, you are in begging mode, period. Pitt also ended up with the 340th non-conference strength of schedule out of 362 teams nationally. If you're on the bubble and the games you chose to play end up 340 out of 362, you're not getting the benefit of the doubt. That's not a conspiracy. That is a theme and a consistent one of the NCAA Tournament Selection Committee. And then last thing, Mike, and I'll come back to your next agenda item. Wake Forest did pass one test. They had four very good wins. Remember, they beat Duke, they beat Clemson, they beat UVA, they beat Florida, all four NCAA tournament teams. However, when you're near the bubble, you're also scrutinized for how you did away from your home court. Why? Because no NCAA tournament games are true home court games. You may be near home, you may have a lot of friends rooting for you, but it's not the Joel Coliseum, for example, for Wake Forest. Wake Forest, as many things as they did well this season, and I was a Deacons fan. I loved watching Steve Forbes' team play. They did zero away from home. Not a little, nothing of significance. These things matter, and if you will follow these basic principles, you will push aside the nonsensical, paranoid, ridiculous conspiracy theories, and you will get back to how this stuff works if you'll stop listening to the wrong people and you'll start listening to the people who get this stuff 98% right virtually every year. If NC State doesn't get the win in D.C. over North Carolina and win the ACC championship, does the ACC get a Wake Forest or a Pitt in? Or would the ACC have been stuck at four? An opinion question? You have a pretty good thinker. Uh, what say you? 
I don't think the ACC would have gotten another bid. One of the cool things in recent years, Mike, is that the committee now tells us who were the first four out. They didn't always volunteer that information. So Wake Forest was not even among the first four out. So we know the Deeks were headed to the NIT, regardless of how many bubbles burst with, you know, the conference champion being a team in a certain league like the ACC that you mentioned, where State would not have been an at-large team. When they got the auto bid, obviously somebody's bubble burst. Same with Oregon winning the Pac-12. The Ducks were not going to be an at-large bid. When they win the Pac-12's auto bid, somebody's bubble bursts. So we know Wake was not caught at the expense of NC State. Pitt was among the first four out, but Pitt was not the first team out. Uh, and I don't think the Pitt Panthers were the second team out either. So it's a great question. And, and the answer is, if Pitt, if, if NC State and Oregon had not had their magical runs, well, yes, two more of those first four out would have been in. It, it is a zero-sum game in that regard, right? NC State costs one of those first four a bit. Oregon costs one of those first four a bit. When FAU lost in its conference tournament, Another bubble burst. Um, so if you if you looked at four unexpected conference champions, yes, the four combined did cost the Pitt Panthers an NCAA tournament bid. But you can't go into any conference tournament weekend assuming that there's going to be no upsets. That just that never happens. So that's why if you're too close to the bubble entering your conference tournament. You know, you can either do what State did, do what Oregon did, and take all the mystery out of the equation, or you're left crossing your fingers hoping that underdogs don't win elsewhere. And in Pitt's case this year, too many underdogs did win their conference tournaments, and that left Pitt on the outside looking in. The Panthers actually ended up declining an NIT invitation. They weren't the only ones. St. John's did the same, handful of others. But as we have five ACC teams headed to the big dance, uh, 20 and 13 Wake Forest is a number one seed in the NIT and taking on App State. Uh, 18 and 14 Virginia Tech accepted an NIT bid and 19 and 15 Boston College accepted an NIT bid. Syracuse, which finished 20 and 12, didn't even get an NIT invitation. Uh, another ACC school that had a pretty solid season. But obviously our focus is on the five that did make it. I'm just glad we had a chance to paint that broader picture uh, as we dive into these great matchups for Carolina and Duke and Clemson and Virginia and, of course, the ACC champion, NC State Wolfpack. You know, David, it was 13 years ago today when I was the director of athletics at Towson and I let go a college basketball Hall of Famer, former ACC head coach at Florida State, Pat Kennedy. He'd gone through seven years, wasn't getting it done. Towson had had 17, 18 losing seasons in a row. It wasn't all Pat's fault, but it was time for a new voice. And we waited until after the season. I walked to his office. I fired him in his office. so He didn't have to do the walk of shame going from my office, which was in another building, through the snow and back to the Towson Center. I bring this up because the name of this show and the name of our promotion with the North Carolina Port Council is called Bacon and Basketball. And sometimes... If you're not winning, your bacon's in the fire and it's going to get fried up. It's going to be served to somebody. Now, one of the things that is really going wild, we're going to talk about the tournament in a second, but I want to get this in. One of the things that's just driving me nuts right now are these neophyte ADs. Can you imagine the, the goof that is felt right now at Long Beach? Coach, they tell Don Monson, hey, you're not coming back after this tournament. Yeah, just, just go ahead and finish it out. And then they win it. That's one of those bids, along with some of those Cinderella stories that, that went away. But Long Beach State right there, good for them. Good for NC State. Good for Oregon. Good for all of these teams that breathe a little bit of life and spontaneity into this tournament. And you're going to have a chance to compete against all of our uh, viewers and listeners right here on the North Carolina Sports Network in this North Carolina Port Council promotion. It's called Bacon and Basketball. David and I will have special guests. We'll be coming to you with shows throughout March Madness. And you have a chance. All you have to do, you're already going to ESPN.com anyway. So go ahead and go to ESPN.com. ESPN, ESPN 
and fill out both the men's and the women's bracket. You don't have to do both, but if you do, you could be the hoops hog of North Carolina that will uh, give out. That's the combined prize for the women's and men's bracket champions. But we'll also be doing a women's bracket championship, a men's bracket championship, and you have a chance to beat DG. If you beat David and his picks, which you probably won't, but if you are smart enough and you get lucky to pick a few upsets and you beat David Glenn, we're going to give you a special limited edition bacon and basketball prize. So stay tuned for that. But each one of our categories, all four, will get a bacon of the month club membership from CEO Roy Lee Lindsay of the North Carolina Port Council. And David, I know you like bacon. I know I like bacon. I've got a body built by bacon. And, and this is going to be a lot of fun. But the one guy, and, and, and I know we're going we're gonna to talk about all of the ACC teams, all of the different seats, but I, I got to have one comment from you on the guy who pulled his bacon out of the fire. Oh, Boo Corrigan was getting up the grill. Oh, first to last week, he was thinking probably going to end up uh, making a change and say goodbye to Kevin Keats after seven years. But old Kevin, the old Lynchburg, Virginia native, pulled his bacon out of the fire. And now the question is, I mean, how do you think he's managing his time? It's not easy. And I think the question you ask there with your Long Beach State parallel is an intriguing one. The way this stuff works, and I know this just having covered the ACC since the 1980s, a lot of times the, the truth serum stories, the what was happening behind the curtain at a really stressful time, often those stories don't come out until months or even years later, sometimes mm -hmm. not even until people retire and then they feel comfortable sharing stories. But I think it's fair to say, well, I know it's fair to say that a lot of wealthy NC State boosters were ready to show Kevin Keats the door. If he had not had that magical run in D.C., it would have been seven years at NC State, only two NCAA tournament bids, and zero NCAA tournament wins. Now, obviously, winning the ACC title at a school that hadn't done it in 37 years changes the entire dynamic. We don't know what Boo Corrigan was thinking, as many Wolfpack fans, including some influential boosters, were hoping to show Kevin Keats the door. Uh, many of those same people will never admit that that's what they were thinking you know, a week ago. Uh, because they want to be on the right side of history with Kevin Keats breaking through and, and the DJ Burns story and the DJ Horn story and so many others that are easy to celebrate on an individual basis beyond this just magical carpet ride for the entire Wolfpack team. Uh, I'm, I don't know if the truth will come out anytime soon because NC Kevin Keats has no incentive to talk about it. Boo Corrigan has no incentive to talk about it. Somebody could ask Kevin Keats at a press conference this week, Coach, did you go to D.C. thinking you were fighting for your job? I had raised my hand in D.C. And, and the moderator nodded, meaning, yes, D.G., you're in the rotation. You saw I asked a lot of the questions there in D.C. in all the post games, but but we ran out of time. Understandably, I'm not complaining. I mean, the Wolfpack was celebrating for a while. I don't even remember what time of day it was, but it, it felt like it was after midnight. So when they said last question from the media, it's not like I was personally offended. But I feel like I know Kevin well enough that he would not have taken that question the wrong way. Some some coach might, right? You just won the ACC title, DJ, and you're asking me about whether I thought I was going to get fired. So you only ask that of a coach that you feel you have a good relationship with in a public setting of that sort. But we ran out of time. No big deal. But somebody might ask him that question. And then Kevin has to decide, is he willing to share whatever private conversations he had with Boo Corrigan on Monday of ACC tournament week? Or is, is that best left behind the curtain? Because the Wolfpack has obviously much bigger fish to fry in the games ahead of them that they think they can win and maybe go on another magic carpet ride. So it's it's a fa it's a fascinating angle in the backdrop to March Madness. Um, and maybe we'll find out that answer. But for now, I'm excited about our bacon and basketball contest, and I'm excited about these five matchups uh, that await us mostly on Thursday and Friday. But also remember, UVA gets things rolling for the ACC in one of those first four matchups on Tuesday night. We're going to get to the breakdown of the five ACC teams in March Madness, but we'll do so on the other side of this timeout. He's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell, and this is Bacon and Basketball on the North Carolina Sports Network, brought to you in part by our good friends down at Wrightsville Beach at Jimmy's.
If you are anywhere near Wilmington, North Carolina, and looking for a little live music, a cold beer, a tangy slushy, a fun crowd, or just a taste of the good life at the beach, Jimmy's Bar in Wrightsville Beach is the place for you. Located on North Lumina Avenue, just one block from the sand and waves of the Atlantic Ocean, Jimmy's features a full bar with nightly beer and drink specials, and it hosts musical performers almost every day of the year. One more fun fact, Jimmy's annual children's bike drive, which started in 2017, now distributes more than 1,000 bicycles and helmets per year to young people in the Wilmington area and beyond. Jimmy's Bar, your home away from home on Lumina Avenue in Wrightsville Beach. It's bacon and basketball time here in the Old North State. Mike Waddell, along with David Glenn, here on the North Carolina Sports Network, will be with you all throughout March and even into April, talking college basketball at this special time of year. So let's go through our five ACC teams in the NCAA tournament field this year and led by the Atlantic Coast Conference champion, North Carolina State Wolfpack, the 11th seed in the South. They'll be heading to the Keystone State, where you're from, David, but on the opposite end, you're from eastern Pennsylvania, around Philly. The pack is headed to Pittsburgh, and they'll be doing battle with Texas Tech. That's a Thursday night after 9 o'clock CBS game against Texas Tech. And this is not the Texas Tech that was coached by Bob Knight, but it is the Texas Tech that has former Tar Heel Kerwin Walton in the backcourt last year and now his second year there in Lubbock. Buddy Holly music uh, nonwithstanding, what do you think the uh, Wolfpack will be singing when they get to Pittsburgh? Well, obviously the Wolfpack is going to be an underdog as the 11th seed, despite their ACC champion status. 11 seeds typically are underdogs to the sixth seed, in this case, the Texas Tech Red Raiders, as you mentioned. I actually like this Wolfpack matchup, and I'll tell you why. Uh, But a couple of fun facts first. One, Kerwin Walton is not only a player for the Red Raiders, he starts most of the time for Texas Tech. As he was at UNC, he's a great three-point shooter. 47% for the Red Raiders this year. Although he doesn't play a huge volume of minutes, he's at eight or nine points per game. So that'll be an interesting State Carolina subplot after the Wolfpack just got the best of the Tar Heels in a much bigger, broader, more important context. A not-so-fun fact for fans to keep in mind of the Wolfpack. Kevin Keats is still searching for the first NCAA tournament win of his entire head coaching career. Remember, he got the Wolfpack job in part because of his great success uh, at a school that has a special place in my heart, UNC Wilmington, where I've taught sports media classes for several years. Coach Keats took the Seahawks to the big dance twice, although they lost their opener both times. And with the Wolfpack, this is his third trip, but the Pack lost their opener both times. So he's 0-4 as a head coach in the big dance. I really believe this can be his first win, even in the aftermath of that emotional high in Washington, D.C. that I was there to witness with my own eyes. Another historical tidbit, and then more on the matchup. Almost all of the surprise ACC tournament winners, meaning, you know, that crazy 1976 Wally Walker and Terry Holland Virginia Cavaliers team, or the 2004 Maryland team that had a losing record in conference play under Gary Williams, but then somehow cut down the ACC tournament nets in 2004. Even that famous 1987 Wolfpack team, the most recent one prior to this year to win the ACC tournament, Uh, That one, of course, under Jim Valvano, Vinny Del Negro, the ACC Tournament MVP. When we think of the greatest surprises in ACC Tournament history, 71 years of ACC Tournament history, those surprise ACC champions have not fared well in the NCAA Tournament. Most have lost their first game in the bigger dance, and even those that won the first failed to make the Sweet 16. So the Wolfpack is fighting history in that regard, but... Here's why I think the Wolfpack, even a five-point underdog Wolfpack, according to the guys in Las Vegas, has a great chance of beating the Red Raiders. Number one, obviously, State's playing well, and especially offensively, State is playing well. There were only four teams this year that shot 51% or better against the Tar Heels, and three of those four teams beat the Tar Heels. 
It was teams like UConn and an explosive Syracuse team. And Tennessee didn't beat the Tar Heels, but they did sh really shoot well and play well offensively, the Volunteers, who, of course, are also a very high seed in this year's NCAA tournament. It wasn't just five wins in five days that the Wolfpack kind of got on a roll offensively. Even when they were struggling late in the regular season, the offensive pieces started to fit together better. DJ Horn, explosive guard. DJ Burns, incredibly hard to defend in the low post. But Mo Diara got a bigger offensive role, and he's a good defender too. Michael O'Connell at point guard, much more instrumental in recent weeks than he was earlier this season. He and Diara are two of the puzzle pieces that have helped the pack fit better over the last month than they did earlier this season. On a given night, Jaden Taylor can help sometimes. You know, Ben Middlebrooks is a good guy off the bench, not as much offensively. But that seven-man rotation has much better chemistry for the Wolfpack than it did earlier. On the Texas Tech side, I believe their best player is a sophomore swingman named Darian Williams. He's about 6'6", 215. He was third team, all Big 12. He was the team's leading rebounder even from his guard slash forward position, even at six foot six, I think he's the Red Raiders' best player. He injured his ankle on Thursday in the Big 12 quarterfinals, did not play in the semifinals on Friday. Now, they believe he will play against the Wolfpack, but we've seen this often in NCAA tournament history. When you miss practice time or you're hurt enough to miss game time, it's rare for you to just be your usual self when you get back. So the Red Raiders' best player is, in the best-case scenario, coming off of a significant ankle injury as we look forward to that game on Thursday night. Meanwhile, Texas Tech's starting center, he's a seven-footer, he's a 24-year-old senior named Warren Washington. He has missed the past month with a foot injury and is not expected to play against the Wolfpack. So that's among your starting five, one's not playing. One is going to be a question mark, not in terms of his talent or skill, but in terms of just how close to 100% he is. One last thing. This is going to be a KYP game for the NC State Wolfpack. All coaches and players know that means know your personnel. Three of Texas Tech's perimeter players are very good three-point shooters. You mentioned Kerwin Walton, who we've seen here in ACC country. Darian Williams, if he's healthy, is a very good three-point shooter. And a guy named Chance McMillan. So three guards you have to defend. you got to get in their grill. you got to force them to put the ball on the floor. Do not give them open three-pointers. But the Red Raiders' starting point guard, a guy named Pop Isaacs, and their starting wing guard, a guy named Joe Toussaint, they are not three-point shooters. They are much more attack-the-basket type guys off the dribble. So in the heat of the moment, every state defender has to know, am I on one of those three guys that I can't leave? Or am I on one of those two guys that I might want to dare to take a three-pointer because they're just not confident three-point shooters? Know your personnel. That has to be part of Kevin Keith's preparation this week. And if there's a key to the game, that is it. For the, if the Wolfpack is going to pull off what Vegas would call an upset on Thursday night. I think one of the keys to the game has to be for D.J. Burns to get some more Mount Olive pickle juice and North Carolina bacon. He's powered by those North Carolina food products. The pack is going to get the big win there in Pittsburgh. That's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. When we come back on the other side of this break, we'll continue talking about the ACC teams in the NCAA field of 68. That's after this from our friends at High Street, the Lawson Insurance Group. The Lawson Insurance Group in Raleigh is a family-owned business led by three actual brothers who happen to be huge sports fans. Ken Lawson, Miller Lawson, and Michael Lawson. I know these guys, I trust these guys, and I send these guys my own insurance business and that of my family. The next time you have insurance needs, I hope you'll do the same. The Lawson Insurance Group is known for its commitment to community and its dedication to ensuring that North Carolinians and their businesses are prepared for life's inevitable challenges with the reminder that as a high street insurance partner, Lawson Insurance Group offers local expertise and support that combined with high street's extensive national resources means more choice and support for you as their client. 
To learn more, search Lawson Insurance Group online. The Lawson Insurance website will be the first link that pops up. We're going through the reverse order from the higher seeds down to the lower seeds, lower being number one, North Carolina. The highest seed from the ACC in the NCAA tournament, NC State, they were the 11th seed. We just talked about their matchup on Thursday night against Texas Tech. I'm Mike Waddell along with David Glenn. David, let's go now to the 10th seed Cavaliers of Virginia. They've won a national championship within the last five years. They understand what it means to be ready come March, and they get the chance to get ready before anybody else. They'll be playing in the first four game there in Dayton. Yeah, this is a pick em game roughly in the eyes of Las Vegas, but I do like the Cavaliers. Not bet the kids' college tuition fund confidence in this pick, but I like the Cavaliers against the Colorado State Rams for a variety of reasons. The key question here is can the Cavs, who have lost five of their last nine games this season, overcome what has been severe offensive limitations? They're still playing the great defense. They almost always do under Tony Bennett, but this has been one of his least prolific teams offensively. Remember in D.C., the Cavs barely beat Boston College. That one went to overtime. And then the Cavs barely lost to NC State. That one also went to overtime. And the Cavs got a bad break in that one because Michael O'Connell's three-point shot that set it to overtime was a bank shot. I don't think he called it a bank shot. Wolfpack did a lot right to earn that win, but that was uh, some lucky stars for the from the Pack's perspective, some unlucky stars for the Cavaliers. It's not like they played horribly against NC State. Isaac McNeely missed a free throw late, and then O'Connell hit his Jimmy V never give up style shot to send that one to overtime. But the great, but by the way, you mentioned UVA winning the national title in 2019. Not so fun fact, the Cavaliers have not won a single NCAA tournament game since they won six straight to capture that title in 2019 against, uh, in, in the eyes of their critics, many of whom told me that UVA would never make a Final Four, never win an ACC title, went, never win an NCAA title. I told those skeptics they were wrong, and Tony Bennett proved them wrong in 2019. But fast forward to today, the Cavs have something to prove given that five-year drought in terms of any more NCAA tournament victories. And for the fans out there, there is a fascinating head-to-head -head matchup uh, awaiting them. We all know Reese Beekman, ACC Defensive Player of the Year, and deservedly so. Ryan Dunn, UVA forward, may be the second best defender in the ACC. Two of the reasons the Cavs have been among the 10 best defensive teams in the country again this year. Colorado State's best player is a six-foot point guard named Isaiah Stevens. One of the best players in the Mountain West Conference, 17 points per game, seven assists per game, but he also hits about 45% of his three-pointers, and if he gets to the free throw line, he makes almost 85% of his three throws. He's a really, really good floor general. So even at 17 points per game, he is happy to distribute. He's unselfish. He's smart. He's been around the block. I imagine Reese Beekman, who is about 6'3 and has long arms, is going to be handed the assignment of dealing with Colorado State's best player, Isaiah Stevens, who, again, is only six feet tall and a point guard. We've seen Reese Beekman minimize the likes of R.J. Davis, uh, of the Carolina ACC Player of the Year, who's roughly six feet tall. So maybe Beekman can slow down or even shut down Isaiah Stevens of Colorado State. That's one of the reasons that I like UVA in this game. Isaiah Stevens, I don't think, often dealt with anybody the defensive caliber of Reese Beekman individually or the defensive caliber, not often anyway, of UVA more collectively. Beekman is really, really smart, great lateral quickness, long arm, 6'3". He can be a massive headache for Isaiah Stevens. Obviously, the unpredictable variable for the Cavs is offense. Reese Beekman is not an elite offensive player, but he's good enough. I do remind people when that system has Kyle Guy and Ty Jerome and DeAndre Hunter running it, it's plenty effective offensively. This year's personnel is simply far short of that. Beekman and the guy I mentioned earlier, the, the shooting guard, Isaac McNeely, they just need help. Sometimes it comes from Andrew Rohde. Sometimes it comes from Jake Groves. Uh, Tane Murray had some good games at the ACC tournament or good moments. Um, and one last reminder, Virginia has won almost all of its close games this season. 
In fact, if they had a dozen close games, they went 11 and one with the only loss being that overtime loss to NC State in crazy, hard to predict fashion. Um, that's a good sign to me. They're familiar with lower possession games. They're familiar with high pressure games. They're familiar with going down to the wire. Uh, you know, Virginia's a headache for teams that don't see their style very often. So for that combination of reasons, I like the Cavs to beat Colorado State, and then they'd end up facing number seven, Texas, uh, right here in Charlotte, North Carolina, in the round of 64. That's David Glenn. I'm Mike Waddell. When we come back, we'll talk about the Clemson Tigers who are going to the field of 68. That's coming up next right here on Bacon and Basketball on the North Carolina Sports Network. I am a better person and a more effective business owner for having known and learned from Emily Parks over many years now. Emily's company, Organize for Success, helps multi-passionate business owners and executives bring harmony to all the layers of their lives, from work to side projects, from friends and family to hobbies, community, and beyond. With Emily's help, you too can make every minute matter. She helps you determine what earns your time and how to efficiently accomplish what matters. One of the many things I love about Emily is that she does not impose her will on her clients. She listens to them. That way, she can better help them cultivate the lives they want to live. You can set up a complimentary call with Emily today by visiting OrganizeForSuccess.com. Now, Brad Brownell is a music fan, David Glenn. He was on your show earlier this year here on the North Carolina Sports Network. I wonder if he'll be singing the blues or if he'll be walking 10 feet off a of beal when the Tigers touch down right there in the Music City of Memphis, not Nashville, and they will be playing New Mexico, the 11 seed, Clemson, the 6 seed. This is a West Regional game. Clemson did not have a very long stay at the 71st ACC Tournament in Washington, D.C. last week, but maybe they put that time to good use down in Little John Coliseum and are trying to figure out what they need to do to show up and be a active participant here in the month of March. To me, the starting question in this one, and it's actually the one of the five ACC matchups, uh, these early matchups, that I have the least confidence in the ACC team, even though Clemson's the number six seed and New Mexico, as you said, Mike, is the number 11 seed. By the way, I love that creative intro. It's clear that you have a professional broadcasting background. Uh, this Friday afternoon matchup on True TV actually has – the Tigers as a slight Las Vegas underdog to the New Mexico Lobos. Again, six seeds are not often underdogs to 11 seeds, but in this case, the Tigers are. And I think one of the reasons for that, fair question, what's wrong with the Tigers, right? Clemson has lost three of its last four games, including at Notre Dame, which finished near the bottom of the ACC standings, at Wake Forest, which is a hard place to win. But then they not only lost to Boston College in the ACC tournament, in the Tigers ACC tournament, um, or uh, an early round matchup, I should call it, 76-55 was the final score. To get beat by 21 by a middling Boston College team that barely made the NIT is a red flag, just like losing to Notre Dame is a red flag. Like the UNC situation, and we'll get to Elliot Cadeau a little bit later, I think the Tigers point guards are dealing with the confidence crisis right now. They're just not playing very well lately. At Carolina, it's the freshman, Elliot Cadeau, and maybe the pressure can get to a freshman. What's unusual at Clemson is that the starting point guard is a fifth-year senior starter, Chase Hunter. He was bad at Notre Dame, and he was bad against Boston College. And you know how much I love P.J. Hall on my first team All-ACC squad, and he made the official team. I love Joe Girard. He, I think of his five years in the ACC, of course, the first year at Syracuse, Brad Brownell, to me, got the best version of Joe Girard, a better version than Jim Beheim, a Hall of Fame coach, got in his four years at Syracuse. There's nothing wrong with Joe Girard and P.J. Hall as an outside-inside combination at all. Those guys are, are key reasons why Clemson's body of work was so good, even though they struggled lately, that they ended up with a six seed, right? Only Carolina as a one and Duke as a four are better seeded than the Clemson Tigers. But Chase Hunter needs to play better. His backups need to play better at guard. Joe Girard helps with ball handling a little bit. 
But New Mexico plays wicked aggressive defense. Everybody knows the Hall of Fame coach Rick Patino. His son Richard Patino is the head coach of the Logos, uh, Lobos, excuse me. And another fun fact: everybody knows the name Jamal Mashburn, former Kentucky star, NBA player. One of the Lobos starting guards is Jamal Mashburn, his son. So you got a whole lot of big names flying around in this New Mexico-Clemson matchup. The Lobos are the highest scoring team in the Mountain West Conference at more than 80 points per game, and they play at a really fast tempo, Mike. You know, in the ACC, Florida State plays a fast tempo. Syracuse did at times. UNC, of course. New Mexico plays at a faster tempo than any ACC team did this year. So keep your eye on the tempo of the Lobos, uh, they're a top 25 defensive team in Ken Palm's efficiency rankings, and they really get out in the passing lanes trying to create steals and easy buckets. I have no concerns that the Clemson uh, big guys, the, the, the most of the veterans, Joe Girard, P.J. Hall, Ian Shefflin, he's a junior player. Jack Clark's a fifth-year senior player, former Wolfpack guy. I, I know they can handle the pressure. I don't know if Chase Hunter and the rest of the Tigers guards can handle that pressure. To me, that is the key of the game. Uh, New, New Mexico has three really good players. Jalen House is a fifth-year senior, the team's leading scorer, and kind of the heart and soul of the Lobos. 16 points per game. He's more, that, more of a driver than a shooter, but he's a three-year starter, so he's not going to flinch in the moment. The Lobos' other two best players are young guys. Sophomore guard named Donovan Dent and a freshman forward named JT, Top, JT Toppin. Um, maybe the more experienced Clemson Tigers, who are one of the most experienced teams in Division I men's basketball, maybe they can take advantage of the fact that two of the three best players on New Mexico are young guys. We'll see. But this is nothing better than a, a coin flip from Clemson's perspective. For, for an ACC comparison, by the way, the Lobos are very much like NC State. The Lobos lost six of their last 10 regular season games in Mountain West play, just like the Pack lost seven of its last nine in ACC play. But then they turned around and won the Mountain West Conference Tournament four days, four wins in four days, just like the Wolfpack had their five and five version up in D.C. So uh, there's a lot of fun angles to this one. Um, but I, I would I would back away from the betting window. And again, it's the least confidence I have of the ACC's five openers. So the ACC five teams in the field, number 11 seed NC State. We talked about them. We talked about 10th seeded Virginia playing in the first four on Tuesday night. We talked about number six seed out of the West, Clemson. And when we come back after this time out here on Bacon and Basketball, brought to you by the North Carolina Port Council, David Glenn and myself will look at Duke and their trip to Brooklyn. We'll talk about the Blue Devils going to the Big Apple right after this, all across the Illinois State on the North Carolina Sports Network. Michael Berard, Managing Director Investments with the Founders Group at Stiefel, works with a select group of high net worth individuals and institutions to develop and implement investment plans tailored to their specific objectives and risk tolerances. If you are interested in highly personalized, well-researched guidance and outstanding personal service, you can contact Michael at 984-364-2002. That's 984-364-2002. Stiefel Nicholas and Company Incorporated, Member SIPC and NYSE. It's March Madness, and we're talking Catamounts basketball. No, not about Western Carolina. They've lost their head coach, Justin Gray, to Coastal Carolina. So he's down there in the teal right now. Getting all warmed up. Congrats to Justin Gray, a past guest, David, of yours on the David Glenn Show. But it's the Catamounts of Vermont against the Duke Blue Devils in the Barclays Center. Duke, a number four seed. Vermont, a number 13 seed. This game on Friday, John Shire had the entire weekend to get his guys ready. And I would expect that the Blue Devils will be itching to get at 
the uh, Catamounts of the University of Green Mountain. Yeah, this is a Friday night matchup on CBS. Duke is an 11-point favorite, last I saw, over the Vermont Catamounts. Uh, but there's a fair question to ask here, and it's what's wrong with Duke guards? Duke's guards. Senior Jeremy Roach, sophomore Tyrese Proctor, and freshman Jared McCain, who, remember, was dealing with that freak pregame injury that had the big bandage on his head. They were not good on senior night in that loss to the Tar Heels at Cameron Indoor Stadium. They were not good in the Blue Devils quarterfinal loss to NC State. Kyle Filipowski and Mark Mitchell, the two Blue Devil big men, they were fine, but they can't do it by themselves. And we often talk about the importance of guard play in March. It's most surprising to me that Jeremy Roach has had these weird back-to-back -back games because he was one of the most consistent, reliable, confident, especially three-point shooters in the entire country for most of the regular season. Hard to know what's going on behind the curtain there, but I imagine if you play that poorly on senior night in front of the Cameron Crazies against your arch rival, you can take an emotional or a mental hit uh, when it goes back to back with the Duke Blue Devils one and done performance in DC. That's a doubly big emotional hit. So it's up to a very young coach, John Shire, to pull his guys back together for a Vermont team that has a 10 game winning streak the Catamounts have won 19 of their last 20 games, and Vermont is by far the best defensive team in the America East Conference. However, for perspective, Vermont's only matchup against an ACC opponent this week, or excuse me, this regular season, was against Virginia Tech, a middle-of-the-pack ACC team, and the Hokies did hammer Vermont by 22 in Blacksburg. That was back in mid-December. So it's a confident Vermont team, 19 out of 20. How can you not be confident there? The other most important thing to know about Vermont is that the Catamounts play at an extremely slow pace. I mean a Virginia-like, or to, look, to, call, to use a reference to a number one seed in this year's NCAA field, a Houston Cougars-like snail's pace, very slowly. They definitely will want to get Duke in a low possession game. Uh, unlike most underdogs, though, the Catamounts have a lot of practice when it comes to low possession games. So this is not going to be a style they're just going to adopt for the NCAA tournament. It's what they do. Vermont's best players are all guards, a sophomore named TJ Long, a junior named, junior named Shamir Bogues, who was all America East, and a senior named Aaron Delaney. Uh, so Deloney, excuse me. So it, it's, it really boils down to this. When the Devils are clicking, their starting lineup of Proctor, Roach, McCain, Mitchell, Filipowski, in my opinion, is one of the best in the entire country. But their chemistry has seemed off for these last two games for reasons I don't fully understand. And they're getting almost nothing, the Blue Devils, from their bench right now with the freshman guard Caleb Foster having been injured lately and nobody else really doing enough during the regular season that John Shire has a lot of confidence in them when he calls on them in the postseason. So th this is, I do like Duke to beat Vermont, and we'll see if it would be Wisconsin or James Madison waiting for the Blue Devils in the round of 32. But it's a scary time for the Devils. Can they rediscover their magic of February and early March? When that's not too long ago, right? They won eight out of nine games while blowing out most of their opponents. Some metrics called Duke for that stretch, again, not too long ago, the third best team in the country behind only one seed UConn and one seed Houston. The Devils beat State by 15 in Raleigh. That was on March 4th. That's just two weeks ago, not even. They beat UVA by 25. They beat Miami by 29. They beat Wake by eight in Durham. All these are recent examples. It's only their last two games that somehow – after that stunning month-long stretch where it appeared all the puzzle pieces were fitting really well, these last two games have turned their season upside down, and that makes the, the, the longer-term future hard to project for these Blue Devils. We know what they're capable of at their best, but they cert certainly haven't shown their best here in the last uh, week or so. Whether you are moving locally, nationally, or even internationally, and whether you're a residential or commercial customer, please consider our friends at XL Moving and Storage, an award-winning Allied Van Lines agent with offices in Greensboro and Raleigh. Thanks to their 25 years of experience helping North Carolinians all across the state 
with their moving and storage needs, XL has become the trusted hometown North Carolina moving services company. Our good friends Jim Dorsett and Jody Hatley, along with their hardworking staff, offer customized, tailored relocation and storage solutions to the people of North Carolina and beyond. Visit them online today at xlms.com. That's E-X-C-E-L-M-S.com. Number one seed, North Carolina, going to Charlotte, and they will be playing the winner of the Howard Wagner game from the first four in Dayton. This game will be going on for the Tar Heels at 2.30 or thereabouts. Yeah, Mike, the Tar Heels are not going to be one of those number one versus number 16 upset victims. I can tell you that. They earned that number one seed. Uh, that is their 18th all-time number one seed in the history of the NCAA tournament. That is the most of any other program in college basketball. A couple of other fun facts. All six of UNC's national championships came in years when the Tar Heels were either number one seeds or there was a time that they didn't seed the field. But that 1957 team uh, was undefeated heading to the NCAA tournament. So obviously they would have been one of the number one seeds. I point that out because the Heels having earned that number one seed is part of what allows them to go to Charlotte and play not a home game technically, but right here in their own backyard where we know they're going to have massive support, which I saw them also have up in D.C. all week long at the ACC tournament. That support didn't quite push them all the way to the title in ACC terms, but I think it has a great chance of pushing these Heels all the way to the Sweet 16 in NCAA tournament terms. Howard and Wagner – all due respect to those conference champions. They don't have enough to compete with the Heels. We'll learn a lot more in the round of 32 when it'll be either Mississippi State or Michigan State. We'll tackle those details on a future show, but the winner of Michigan State, Mississippi State, will be the Heels opponent in the round of 32. Both of them, by the way, are better defensive teams than offensive teams. But the question about the Tar Heels, can they return to the levels of defense, rebounding, and three-point shooting that enabled them to go 27 and 7 this season and enabled them to win eight straight games before that loss to NC State in the ACC title game. When the Heels are defending, rebounding, and hitting threes, they are capable of a national championship. I know UConn is really good and should be the favorite in this tournament. Head to head, I would predict UConn over Carolina. And obviously, they played each other during the regular season, and the Huskies did beat the Tar Heels. The, the Heels are capable of beating anybody and everybody in this tournament, but all three of those elements have to be in play. Defense, rebounding, and three-point shooting. ACC Player of the Year, R.J. Davis, plus fifth-year senior center, Armando Baycott, plus Swiss Army Knife, Harrison Ingram. That combination gives the, the Heels three all-ACC players that most opponents definitely cannot handle, including Howard and Wagner, or the winner of that one, uh, on Thursday as the Heels host them sort of in Charlotte. Carolina collectively remembers one of the best defensive teams in the entire country. That is part of their very stable foundation, one that I believe will make them a Sweet 16 team. After that, things will get more difficult. But as you and I both know, Mike, and we've talked about it for months here on the North Carolina Sports Network, the three-point shooting of Harrison Ingram and Cormac Ryan, who work really hard on defense, really hard. They're part of why Carolina is one of the 10 best defensive teams in the country. Since mid-February, the three-point shooting of those guys has been unpredictable. Since mid-February, Harrison Ingram has made nine of 40 three-pointers. That is 23%. Now, he has a pretty reliable accuracy rate for the season, but he's 23% lately. Against Pitt and NC State at the ACC tournament, Cormac Ryan made only two of 11 threes. That's, a, that's 18%. And that was after he had six threes, remember, in the Heels' big win at UVA. And he had six more threes in the Heels' big win against Duke in Durham to close the regular season. So which Cormac Ryan is it going to be from three-point land? Which Harrison Ingram is it going to be from three-point land? Those are valid questions about the Tar Heels that I don't think are a big concern in the round of 64, but obviously become bigger issues moving forward. Last thought on the Tar Heels, since we'll have a chance to talk about them again before they play either Michigan State or Mississippi State. 
the confidence level of freshman point guard Elliot Cadeau is a serious issue right now. Side fact historically, UNC has never won a national championship with a freshman point guard. Dean Smith's system, Roy Williams' system, Hubert Davis's system asks a lot of the point guard. And if you think back to all the Tar Heels national champions, it was a veteran, Joel Berry, a junior in 2017, running the point. It was a junior, Ty Lawson, in 2009. It was a junior, Raymond Felton, in 2005. It was a junior, Derek Phelps, in 1993. It was a senior, Jimmy Black, helping Worthy and Perkins and Jordan to the NCAA title for Dean Smith in 1982. It was even a junior, Tommy Kearns, way back before most of us were born in 1957. Elliot Cadeau obviously is not a junior or a senior. That's not his fault. But more importantly, he was not good at all against NC State. He did have eight assists and only one turnover. That's what the Heels need out of him. And they've gotten that more often than not. But he has zero confidence as a three-point shooter right now. He's at 18% for the season. And he's been up and down with his drives to the basket. He can be good at that skill, depending on the defensive matchup. But he has to be of the mindset that he needs to distribute the ball to an open uh, Cormac Ryan, an open Harrison Ingram, down low to Armando Baycott, defer to R.J. Davis. Because at this stage of his career, who knows what he'll develop into. But at this stage of his career, Elliot Cadeau must be a ball handler, a very deferential passer, and he needs to remind himself he doesn't need to be the guy taking eight, nine, ten shots against NC State or anybody else when he is surrounded by player of the year R.J. Davis, a All-ACC Armando Baycott, All-ACC Harrison Ingram, and a 25-year-old 60-year college player named Cormac Ryan, in addition to guys like Seth Trimble and Jalen Withers and Jalen Washington off the bench. All of those guys are better offensive options especially the starters, than Elliot Cadeau is. He needs to accept that and embrace that and find his confidence in a more limited role if the Tar Heels are going to get where they want to go. North Carolina Port Council, you see it right here in the bottom of the screen. It's bacon and basketball. Go ahead and go to your ESPN.com platform. Pick out both a men's bracket and a women's bracket. Join our group. You can see all the details on our Twitter page, on our web page. Just follow along and you have a chance to compete against David Glenn, to compete to be the best men's tournament bracket, the best women's tournament bracket, and the best combined men's and women's bracket can be the Hoops Hog of North Carolina, brought to you by the North Carolina Port Council. David, thanks a lot for joining us here at the beginning of the week. We'll look forward to the first four in Dayton and then back with games on Thursday and Friday, Saturday and Sunday, right here on the North Carolina Sports Network. We'll talk to you soon.